Timbers Church Online. I'm Pastor Johanna, and today we're wrapping up our series, Set the Table. This series has all been all about preparing for Easter and looking at the tables in the Bible, because ultimately, God has invited every single one of us to sit at the table of the kingdom, to be a part of his family. And as followers of Jesus, we share in the responsibility of setting the table for others to come and sit. We've looked at the table where Jesus served his disciples in John chapter 13, the table where Zacchaeus invited Jesus to his house in Luke 19, and we looked at the banquet table parable in Luke 14. And today we're going to look at one more table that Jesus himself was invited to. I have never worked well with to-do lists and chores and rigid schedules. Just being completely honest, that's just me. And the thing that I hate more than anything is house chores. I love to cook, I love to create, but the mess after is really not my thing. Laundry, thank God for my mother-in-law. Because sometimes I'm really good at washing, but I can never get it folded and I definitely don't get it put up. It almost never happens. And for a long time, I used to think that I was the only one. I thought there was something broken in me. I wanted to be in a wife and a mother so badly, but I completely failed at homemaking every single day of my life. Now, this doesn't mean that I haven't tried or attempted to become better because I absolutely have. And thankfully for all that is wrong with social media, thanks to it, I have found that I'm not alone in my loathing of the laundry and the dishes and all the things when it comes to homemaking and cleaning. Consider these memes that I found. Instead of cleaning, I just watched an episode of Hoarders, and I didn't realize how fantastic my house really looks. Everyone, anyone ever been there? Um, how about this one? My house is clean, and then my kids woke up. The end. And uh, how about this one? You ever start deep cleaning just to be mad at everyone in the house? I have. Confession, I have. Now, these last two, they really got me. I had to clean my house for two hours just to tell my guests, sorry, the house is a mess. <laughs> and this last one, I like you so much that I don't even mind frantically cleaning my house before you come for a vis visit. Thanks to these memes, kindred spirits unite. I have definitely started cleaning just to be so angry at every single person in my house that I didn't even want to look at them anymore. And isn't it like the downright truth that we invite people over to our house just to clean in such a way that we don't want them to see how we actually live. And so we say, I am so sorry for this mess. Um, and when we have guests coming over, we can sometimes get so caught up in all of the preparation, so distracted by the production, so focused on the presentation. Well, this happened to Mary in the Bible. Let's look at what it says in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. It says, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him, her, him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. And she came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, 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 you're worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary's discovered it and it will not be taken from her. Jesus is invited to the table of Martha. Table's in her home. And she had a sister, Mary, and we can also imagine that Lazarus was present as well. All three, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, were siblings, and they were also dear friends of Jesus. This is one of my all-time favorite Bible stories because many times when Jesus was teaching, he used parables and comparisons. But in this recollection, we get an actual comparison between two actual sisters, Mary and Martha. What are they doing? Where are they doing it? And Jesus himself makes a comparison between these two women. And what he basically says is where your focus is matters. That it matters where your focus is. That your focus matters. Because here's our big idea for today. That what you're focused on will flow from you. What you are focused on, what consumes you, it'll flow from you. Your flow comes from your focus. What you're focused on determines the way that you're going to go. It determines why you are going. It determines the fruitfulness and the fullness of your life, or maybe the frustration of your life, because your focus is your flow. What you're focused on will flow from you. Let's consider Martha. What flowed from her was frustration. 
Jesus was coming to her house, but this just wasn't a one-time grand affair. Jesus was her friend, a dear friend. So, of course, Martha has all the things happening. She has planned the menu, started the preparations. In the midst of all of it, she is focused. Martha's focused. But what she was focused on led to her frustration. What flowed from her was frustration. Luke 10, verse 40, it says, But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. Jesus was invited. Jesus was coming. Jesus was there in her home. But Martha was distracted. She got so wrapped up in her party planning for Jesus that she forgot about Jesus. Looking at Martha, it's easy to think, who could do that? We would never do that. If Jesus was among us, standing next to us, walking with us into our homes and dining with us, we could never forget about him. I mean, come on, it's Jesus. How could we not be focused on him? But even with the best intentions and a heart motivated to serve, we can get distracted. We can lose our anchor, the thing that is centering us. And the moment that happens, frustration sets in. Resentment will build up. And interestingly enough, jealousy often enters the picture. Can't you see it? Martha's focused on her work, her plan, fixated on what Mary isn't doing, and it leads her to critique Mary. It leads her to judging Mary. And the same is often true of us, that when we become so fixated on our frustrations, frustration begins to flow from us. And what we do is we project our issues on other people and we start to be an expert in how other people should be living their lives. The things they should or shouldn't be doing. Martha knew perfectly how Mary should be Mary, which was try to become a little bit more like Martha. And with misplaced focus, not only do we have an opinion on what other people do, It often makes us have an opinion on what we think God should do. We don't just critique others. We begin to critique Jesus and tell him what to do. In verse 40, Martha says, She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all of this work? Tell her to come and help me. She begins to tell Jesus how to be Jesus. You see, they're at a table and Martha goes to Jesus. The language use is to say that Martha is actually standing over Jesus, that he is sitting and teaching. And Martha, who threw this lavish party for the Jesus that she loved, but she's so wrapped up in what, has forgotten about the who, and most definitely forgotten the why, and ultimately has probably lost her way just a little bit, that not only is she angry at Mary, but she interrupts Jesus, accusing him of not caring. Excuse me, Jesus, do you, don't you think it's unfair that Mary's just sitting here while I have to do everything? Tell her to help me. Here's the summary. If the things we're doing for God aren't fueled by time with God, we begin to think we are God. Let me repeat that. If the things we are doing for God aren't fueled by time with God, we begin to think we are God. Martha is focused on her to-do list, her agenda, her desired outcome, and what flows from her frustration. But here's the interesting part, Jesus. Sweet and tender, Jesus does not shame her. He doesn't reprimand her. He doesn't even tell Martha to be quiet. He says, Martha, 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 Martha. Now don't get this confused with Jesus saying her full name because any child knows that when you get the middle name and your first name, it's no bueno. It's not a good sign at all. And then your last name too, your full entire name, well, you're in big trouble. But what he says to her is her name, Martha, Martha. There's affection in the repetition because just as in other parts of scripture, when Jesus repeats a name, what follows is a gracious blend of kindness and maybe a little bit of sadness and surprise. And here in Luke 10, Jesus reminds her, Martha, Martha. Martha, you are distracted. The Lord says to her, Martha, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. He's saying, Martha, Martha, you are distracted and worried. You are divided and pulled apart. You are falling to pieces and your focus has you pulling away. What you focus on flows from you and what flowed from Martha was frustration. And it was pulling her away from Jesus. Take a moment and think about that. What are you frustrated about? What's irritating you? Who's frustrating you? And how much of your day is spent focusing on that thing? Think about what you're nursing and rehearsing. What are you replaying over and over? What's that thing that was said to you that you're so focused on that has led you to being distracted and frustrated? What are you trying to accomplish that has consumed your focus and it doesn't line up with what God has called for you? 
difficult for you to do and so you're frustrated. Things are going the way that you want them to in the time frame that you want and you're frustrated because you're focused on something that consumes you, distracted by many things, consumed with many emotions. Martha was so consumed with what she wanted that she forgot who she was with and she missed it. She was so busy doing something for Jesus that she forgot to be with Jesus. And we can miss it too. We can miss Jesus. Now let's look at Mary. Her focus was on Jesus and it flowed from her. It's like you can see and feel peace because Mary is at the feet of Jesus. As Jesus is speaking to Martha, he says in verse 42, there is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary's discovered it and will not be taken from her. Jesus says there's only one thing worth being concerned about. There is one thing worth being focused on. There is one thing that is worth being consumed with. And Mary is focused on it and it won't be taken from her. It will actually flow from her. In verse 39, Mary is sitting at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. That's what the Bible says. Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet. Every time in scripture where we find Mary, Mary of Bethany, sister to Martha and Lazarus, we also find her at Jesus' feet. When her brother died, she fell at Jesus' feet in grief. When Lazarus, her brother, was brought back to life and there was a huge celebration, she goes and anoints the feet of Jesus with oil out of great gratitude. And here we see her sitting, learning. Her position at the feet of Jesus is actually the position of a scholar, of a disciple. The culture at that time was for a rabbi or a teacher to sit in a chair and for the scholars to sit at their feet and learn. Mary was focused on Jesus. She was focused on what he was saying. And that focus led to so many things flowing from her. She thought so highly of him. She greatly esteemed him and so focused on him. It drew her closer to him. And Jesus says, this is the thing that mattered. This is the thing worth her focus. As a mother, there have been so many times where I want my children's attention, not just to get them to do something, but to connect with them. I want their attention. I want them to see me. I want to see them to make sure that they also see me. I'll say something like, look at me when I'm talking to you. Look at me when I'm talking to you. Take your eyes off that Nintendo Switch. Take your eyes off that computer that you're working on. Take that eyes off that craft that you're doing. I want you to look at me when I'm talking to you because I want your attention. I wanna see them. Aren't there people in our lives that we want their attention? Because we know that if we can get their attention for them to look at us, we might be able to connect with their heart. If I can get my children to look in my face, I can get them to see me, to see that I love them. And can't you imagine Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, hanging on every word, focused on his face? Mary was drawn to Jesus. Martha, focused and frustrated, was drawn away from Jesus. But Mary, her focus was on Jesus. And Jesus says, this is the thing that matters. David was a king in the Old Testament. And he's often referenced as a man after God's own heart. He wanted to draw near to God. In Psalms 27, 4, he says, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. David wanted to be close to God. He wanted to draw near to God, to be able to focus on God. And in verse 8, it says, My heart says of you, seek his face, your face, Lord, I will seek. His response was, Lord, I'll seek your face. Does God miss our face? I think sometimes he does. He misses us being intently focused on him because what we focus on flows from us. If we're never sitting at the feet of, never sitting at the feet of Jesus focused on him, we're going to miss out. We're going to miss out on joy. We're going to miss out on purpose. We're going to miss out on peace. We're going to miss out on connection. We're going to miss out on relationships as he's intently put in our lives if we're not focused on him and his face. If we don't sit at the feet of Jesus, then what flows from us will be frustration and distraction and it will leave us anxious and worried and pulled away. But focused on Jesus, we will overflow. It makes me think about a fountain, that we are fountains. I have a friend that says she imagines herself as a tall and beautiful fountain. But you're a fountain. I'm a fountain. And we have water in us. And what we're focused on, what we're connected to, fills our fountain. And every single person in our life drinks from the overflow of our fountain. So what are they drinking? Think about it. What are they drinking out of your fountain? Is it sour water? 
fresh from a heart full of resentment and hurt? Is it murky, mossy water because you've been so distracted you haven't tended to it? Or is it possibly fresh, pure, life-giving water because what is flowing to you is flowing from Jesus and it's flowing out of you because you're focused on him? Think about it. We say all the time, what's in the well comes up in the bucket. Because what is in the well is there because that's what we're focused on. And what we're focused on fuels us. In the very beginning of the Bible, when the Israelites have fled Egypt, God has rescued them. They go into the wilderness, but they don't know how they're going to eat. And they definitely don't know how they're going to drink. They need water in that wilderness. And God provided it. God provided for them every step of the way. He gave them water in the wilderness. And so interestingly enough, there's an annual celebration called the Feast of Tabernacles that Solomon built the tabernacle. He built the temple where the presence of God would be. King Solomon did this. He was the son of David. And then annually, they would celebrate and remember all the ways that God had provided them. And so part of the Feast of Celebrations was emphasizing how God provided water to Israel in the wilderness on their way to Canaan. Outside of the temple was a huge, what's called a migvah, a migvah, and it was called the Pool of Siloam. And recently we got to be there. Nick and I got to be there. We got to see the Pool of Siloam. We also got to met the man who discovered it because it was buried underneath layers and layers and layers of dirt and layers and layers and layers of things. But he discovered it and he uncovered it. And what it was, was the Pool of Siloam. And the Pool of Siloam was a migvah. A migvah is a body of water used for cleansing in preparation to go to the temple. This is thought, the Pool of Siloam, to be the largest migvah that ever was. And so from Solomon building the temple all the way to the time of Jesus, this pool was used for cleansing, to prepare people and to prepare things to be able to go into the temple. Now, a mikvah is an interesting body of water because it's kind of like a pool, but it has to have water coming in it, but it also has to have water flowing from it. It can't just be stagnant water sitting there. There has to be water flowing into it. And there has to be water flowing out of it. The pool of Siloam was a mikvah that had water flowing into it and then also water flowing out of it. So during this Feast of the Tabernacles, which lasted eight days, a priest would come down from the temple, would carry water from the Pool of Siloam in a golden pitcher and walk it all the way up the stairs back up to the temple. And Nick and I got to walk on those ancient thousand year old stairs. It was kind of incredible. We walked from the Pool of Siloam all the way up to the temple. And so they would get that water and they'd put it in a golden pitcher and they'd carry it up and all along the streets, people would be out in the streets chanting and singing and praising. There's water, there's water that God provides water. God miraculously provided water for the thirsty people in Israel. And when the priest got back up to the temple, he'd pour that water out of the altar. And it was a reminder of God who miraculously provided for a thirsty Israel in the wilderness. But on the eighth day, there was no pouring of water. There was only prayers for water to remind them that they came into the promised land that there was water provided and they needed to continue to pray to God to provide water well in John chapter 7 this feast of the tabernacles is actually happening and it starts out in the beginning of John saying there's a feast happening and it's the feast of the tabernacles and what's interesting is in verses 37 through 38 it says on the last day of the festival Jesus stood and shouted on the last day of the festival, on day eight, where no water is being poured out, Jesus stood at the temple shouting to the people, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Jesus boldly called people to himself to drink and to satisfy their deepest thirst, their spiritual thirst. He says, this water, you don't need this water in this pool. You need real water. You need me, the living water. And then water will flow to you and flow from you. Water will supply you and water will carry you. And I, Jesus, am that water. What you are focused on will flow from you. And if you're focused on me, living water will flow from you. Are you thirsty? Are you burnt out? Are you distracted and frustrated and exhausted and heavy burdened and wandering in the wilderness in need of water? Focus on Jesus. Drink from the never ending supply of water that he has to offer you because he says he'll satisfy you. 
And Jesus didn't only speak of something coming into a person. And we don't go to Jesus just to get something for us, but that ultimately it's something that should flow out of us as well. That it's not only a blessing received, but it's also becoming a source of blessing to others. Listen, what you are focused on will flow from you. It's the truth. What you are focused on will flow from you. So what's flowing from you? That determines what you're focused on. And maybe you need to change your focus because what we want to flow from us is the joy and the peace and the hope of Jesus. And what should flow from us is Jesus. What we're focused on flows from us. So what are you focused on? Because other people are drinking from our fountain. Other people are drinking from what we're focused on. Are we giving them frustration? Are we giving them a fascination with a holy living God who is our supplier of goodness and joy? A God who has rescued us. A God that we need. Because what we focus on flows from us. And what should flow from from us is Jesus. Let's pray. God, I'm so grateful for the beauty of your word. How from Genesis to Revelation, there's a thread of redemption that you are constantly working in people, that you're constantly drawing people to you because you are the answer for everything that we need. God, we can get so consumed and so distracted by so many things. So many things want to rob us of our joy and our peace. God, our frustrations can consume us. The people in our life who have hurt us can consume us. The circumstances of our life can be so distracting that we focus so so on them that it can cause frustration and exhaustion to flow from us. But God, you offer us a place to come so that your goodness can flow from us. May we never forsake the opportunity to sit at your feet and to gaze into your face, to listen to you, to learn from you, to be consumed by you. Jesus, you are the gift. You are the living water. May we come to you so that your living water would flow from us to others. And in this Easter season, we could truly point others to you because you are flowing from us, that you are the source of our life, that you are the one that comes from us because we're focused and connected to you. It's in Jesus' name that I ask all of these things and pray these things. Amen. Amen. We hope that you were encouraged by this message today. Next week is Easter. It's Easter. It's a celebration of a living God who came back to life, who came to serve us, who came to love us, who came to create a new kingdom for us to be a part of. It's an exciting thing. We hope today's message has been an encouragement to you. We can't wait to see you next week for Easter.